Okay, round two of trying to uh, do this video. Um, got my pool cleaned out. I've got a bunch of little things done. Um, got a video up that you guys hopefully have seen earlier and subscribed to my channel. Right now we're going to do Hurricane. We're going to do a chapter 16 out of this book, Disloyal, a memoir. Uh, the true story of the former president attorney. Uh, I'm reading it. It's backwards to me on here. The true story of the former personal attorney to President Donald J. Trump by Michael Cohen. Um, we are on chapter 16, Typhoon Stormy, part three. Okay, so uh, when we left chapter 15, uh, Michael was talking to Donald about the Muslim ban, and Trump said that was Bannon and Miller. So, okay, so that's where we left off. Chapter 16 starts out with a Wall Street Journal story that caused a shit storm about um, Michael Payne, Stormy Daniels, $130,000 uh, through his Shell Corporation in Delaware, okay? Um, and that happened before the 2016 elect election, and that was perfectly true. Um, but at this time, he was um, dead set on um, enforcing the non-disclosure agreement that, uh, and wanted to make sure that uh, Stormy stayed quiet. Do you remember back in the early part of this book, um, at that point, Stormy didn't want this story to come out, and neither did the president. So Michael set up this fake letter that uh, both of them denied that this ever happened. It was just some story, and both of them said, no, no, it didn't happen. Well, now she's coming out and saying, well, that was all a lie. Okay. Um, so uh, so Michael's decided to, uh, to sue uh, Daniels and her new lawyer, Michael Avignati, who Michael Cohen is not very impressed with. And I forgot my, I forgot my, um, speak my, uh, mic. I need my mic because some of you say you can't hear. So let me put it in. Well, The stupid iPad has a cover on it that's like heavy duty because I bought this for my husband as a birthday present one year and he never uses it. He doesn't know how to use it, so I use it. But it still has this really rugged cover on it and I can't hardly get the thing in there. So I hope you guys could hear what I said earlier, okay? So now we're at uh, Michael Avignotti and, um, and uh, so the whole deal was... Uh, it, expl it all exploded, and he went to, um, Michael went from being Trump's personal attorney to a household name, and Stormy Daniels went from being a small-time porn actress to a famous, the only reason she's a star is because of this. She's a famous a adult actress, the most famous anyway, so anyway, um, she started coming on 60 Minutes, and so this is when she was like hinting about, um, oh God, it's so gross to even think about, about what Trump's private parts looked like. It just gags me. Um, and there was another book that came out, and I think Bob Woodward wrote it. I think I, read, I listened to it um, on Audible called Fire and Fury. I think that's by Bob Woodward. And, uh, he was like coming out with, uh, Cohen says, how can he know what's going on in the White House? He's sitting on a couch in a hallway, uh, you know, and uh, he really doesn't know what's going on behind the scenes. So on the new book, though, on Rage, he has several 18 phone conversations with Trump. So I think that's going to be a whole different deal. So anyway, uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, the Fire and Fury book triggered a bunch of events that turned over the politics and resulted in Michael writing the account of this book from the sewage treatment plant in a federal prison camp, which I think is kind of funny, but 
but he read the book and he wasn't impressed with it. Um, so now he's talking about, um, oh, so now he's inspired to write his own book. And his idea was to pr portray Trump's real estate deals and his genius, because at this point he still, you know, he still thinks Trump's a genius, right? And, um, and he's saying the genius he's displayed as a, he was going to write a companion book to the art of the deal. Michael was. So, um, Trump acquired this uh, property at 40 Wall Street and um, in the 90s, and sh which showed how, how smart he really was in real estate, and even though he had so many weaknesses and failures um, in other parts of his life, mainly women, and it, or his fatal flaw, one of his fatal flaws. And uh, Trump said that he had bought this skyscraper for a million dollars, and I guess he repeated that on The Apprentice, that it was worth hundreds of millions of dollars now, or then, whenever. Um, anyway, he cleaned up on that deal, and um, he bought a 1920 skyscrapers in a slump for pennies on the dollar, which is how he got, gets all of his property. Uh, the Cluj Estate, Doral, the Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Lago, the Grand Hyatt, and um, he's, Michael says when it comes to real estate, Trump's father taught him well. So um, the title of Michael's book was going to be Trump Revolution from the Tower to the White House, Understanding Donald J. Trump. And that's the title he was thinking about. He had a ghostwriter and he had a fancy agent. And uh, they had a proposal that outlined the basic approach to this. And uh, unlike other people that were writing about Trump, he really had known Trump for, for the past decade. And he promised to write about the Russian investigation and his role, and the continue, he was going to continue to lie about uh, the uh, Trump Tower in the Moscow Tower deal, Ta Moscow Tower deal, because that would go against what Trump was talking about all through the uh, campaign. Um, but he was going to seek revenge on the reporters he thought had dealt unfairly with uh, tr with Trump and, co and himself. So, um, so he says he couldn't leave sleeping dogs lie, and he also promised to c clear up the deal with uh, Stormy Daniels and the hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and he paid her that a week before the election. He said he wasn't going to let anybody know that he had been repaid the money in, in, in the form of fake legal fees or any other way. He, uh, and that he had done everything at the direction of the president. He's just out on his own paying this bill for him to keep him out of trouble. Um, let's see. But the White House said no he didn't they didn't want him to write a book and they didn't say why so he he did go on a road show with the agent um meeting with other top editors and um there was a lot of interest in the book but um let's see he wanted to be economical with the truth because he still even to this day, has a lot of love and affection for Donald Trump. I mean, that's how this guy gets people. I just don't get it. So, anyway, the book proposal leaked to the Daily Beast, and all hell broke loose. And he doesn't know who who uh, leaked it, but he thinks it was. He went to you know five or six different um, publishers and. Um, one of those people he suspects doing it. But here comes Stormy Daniels, and she wanted to sell her story, and she didn't want Michael to beat her to it. So that might have had a lot to do with it, too. Um, so he said he uh, he bullied and misled the reporters he'd known for years, all, all to keep the truth from coming out. He did not want anybody to know that Trump knew about the $130,000. And the whole deal about this and why he didn't want people to know was we can go back to the to the last uh, chapter when uh, he decided to or when he talked Trump into paying this this deal off just because something isn't true doesn't mean that it can't hurt you 
And uh, so that's why he said, yes, I did this. I did this for my boss because just because something isn't true doesn't mean it couldn't hurt him and I didn't want him to get hurt. So that was a, that was how and why. Because what lawyer would pay the client's bills? You know, no, no lawyer does that. But Michael did it because he didn't. He knew he, he wanted him to win the presidency and he didn't want, to, want him to get hurt by it. So that that was how. Uh, that all happened. It was a lawful payment. It wasn't a campaign contribution, and it wasn't any kind of a. It didn't. Co it didn't come out of Trump's pocket. Period. Well, yeah, it did. It's because he paid him back. Um, so, um, so you know, he's saying even false information about Trump could cause him harm if it were published. Why would any lawyer pay a client's expenses? But here's the thing. Um, Remember my old boyfriend I told you about that was kind of like this? You lie, you lie, you lie, and you lie some more. And if something doesn't work out, you lie about it. You lie and you lie and you spin this web of lies and you keep tripling and doubling and tripling down. And um, it was like the simplest, instead of the simplest explanation being the, li the likeliest, it, it involved complicating the narrative, you know, and, and then just piling more incredible stuff on top of it and people believe it and if you can keep stick to your story or add more or confuse them people go for it you know I'm I, I don't know I'm not a liar I don't know how to do this uh, if I ever did lie which I have before of course when uh, like I was a teenager <laughs> I, I, of course I lied to my mother or father you know to get to go somewhere or do something or whatever or where telling them where I'd been of course I had and I always got caught Always, always got caught. Got my shirt back on, you guys. Um, and, and you know what I figured out a long, long time ago? I'm not good at it. Uh, I am not good at lying, and I, uh, I know that about myself, and I might as well not do that. So anyway, Michael and Donald Trump are uh, pros. So, uh, and if that doesn't work, Bottom line, just tell them to fuck off or just say fuck you. That was their method. So anyway, um, he's getting ready. Oh, God, this is a horrible story, okay? So um, he's getting ready for a break. He wants to go to Nevada. This friend of his wants to fly out on his private jet to go to Nevada to look at a property, and he asked Michael to go with him. And so Michael says, okay, I need to get out of town for a little. I need a break. So he, he's, they're, in the, they're in the limo on the way to the airport, right? And uh, Trump calls him. And uh, he often talked to Trump uh, on the phone. This was before all the shit hit the fan, right? Uh, but, but he was still his personal attorney, right? So... Um, and here he talks about how Trump, you know, never ever used emails or wrote anything down. You know, he used inferences, nods, silences, euphemisms, but he he did not want any kind of a, of um, proof that could hurt him. He doesn't actually say, "I want that guy dead." He would say, "Boy, it sure would be nice if that guy were dead," you know. And then you know, one of his guys says. Oh, hey, I guess the boss wants me to go kill that guy. And then Trump's happy. That's, he doesn't actually say, go, go do that. Never does. But so Michael knew his language. He, told, he said that, told that to the Senate. Um, I don't remember which Senate committee it was, but judiciary, right now. I don't remember. Some kind of Senate hearing that Michael came to and uh, talked to him. And he said that, you know, he was... Uh, he, he used little inferences to get Michael to do what he wanted him to do so Michael would understand. Um, but he never explicit, explicitly said what he wanted because it could be used against him. So he surrounded himself with people who could translate his intentions. So anyway, Michael's in this limo with this guy. His name is... Um, I don't know what his name is. But anyway, so Michael, Trump calls and uh, he goes, Hey, Michael, man, how are you doing? Listen, I've got Melania on the phone and I want you to tell her all about this Stormy Daniels deal. And, you know, and um, so Trump made her participate in the call. And so then 
Michael lies and lies and lies and lies. And uh, he, Michael also thought that Melania was the epitome of class. <laughs> so Trump wanted M Michael to, to tell her exactly what had not happened. There was nothing to it. He wanted to reaffirm his innocence uh, when, whenever he was accused of cheating on her, and he wanted Michael to back him up. And he was told, Michael told her the whole thing, you know, I was worried that he would be hurt by it, and a lie can hurt you just as bad as a false law. A falsehood can hurt you. If people believe it, you can be hurt by something that's not true. And so that's what he just kept going round and round and round with Melania. And... Uh, it was like almost like Trump believed the lies himself, okay? And he didn't care about the truth. Trump doesn't care about the truth. And if the facts didn't suit him, he, he'd deny them, change them, invent them, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and Mrs. Trump, as we learned in the, uh, the book Melania and Me by Stephanie Wolkoff, she doesn't care. She doesn't care what Trump does. She doesn't care at all, um, except that it's embarrassing. Um, so and Michael and, and so Michael ta told her, you know, I paid one hundred and thirty thousand out of my own pocket to protect the president, or the president elect at that time. And Trump says, you paid one hundred and thirty thousand. This is over the phone, out of your own pocket for me. And Michael's like, yeah, I did, I did, sir. And so anyway, um, so he had. Uh, He's telling her how he had fought on Trump's behalf to sil silence libelous and predatory, predatory fake stories. And um, he was feeling really badly about lying to Mrs. Trump, but he didn't have a choice. And so, and then he's telling her all about, about this, and she says, I know all of this. Of course she does. And uh, so then uh, he, subject was changed to kids at their school, okay? I mean, Jake was in the same school as, and Samantha went to the same school as Stephanie Wolkoff school and the same school that Barron went to, right? Um, so anyway, then they hang, hang up, and um, Michael's like, you're one of the best, Michael, blah, blah, blah. And so the guy in the car who owned the Gulfstream that they were going to Nevada in, he goes, so do you think that uh, she believed you? Michael goes, not a chance, not a chance did she believe me. So then here we are back to um, Michael Avignotti, who constantly taunts Ma Michael Cohen and calling him an idiot and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, which obviously ended up leading to his own downfall. I don't know if he's still in prison or not, but he did go. Um, but Michael was living well. He had a new office in um, Squire Patent Boggs law firm in the Rockefeller Plaza, um, which was a big deal because then they could say, hey, the personal attorney to the president of the United States has an office in our, in our office. He's part of our firm, right? It was a big, it was a big coup for them. Um, but what Michael was doing at this point was he was, uh, and I think you guys will probably remember this, how he was taking all this money from big companies like AT&T, Columbus, BTA, uh, Nova. Well, see, with most people, when they come into um, power or, you know, they, they know who to talk to. Like, like if Joe Biden wins, when Joe Biden wins, they will know who his people are because he's already been there. He's, he's, been in, he's been in D.C. forever. They, these kind of companies know who to go to to get um, FaceTime with, uh, with Joe Biden, but they don't know anybody but Michael, you know, to, so they were paying Michael. Uh, millions of dollars up front to get to get them in front of Trump. Okay, um, so yeah, he was cashing in on his relationship. What would you know? Of course he was. Okay, so um, so then he flies down to Mar-a-Lago on this other guy's private jet. Um, he was a real, really, but it multi-billion dollar guy. Um, he was the kind of dude had, who had, he was so rich, he had Drake perform at his daughter's bar, bit, bar, bat mitzvah, bat mitzvah. So then, um, he says, these are the super yacht type of people. 
Um, and he says all the uh, yapping from Avignotti and the tut tuts from the liberal cable people were like water off a duck's back. He didn't care. So then he, he went to Florida and he wanted to meet with Hamad bin Jassim, or Hasim, starts with a J, I don't know how that's pronounced. Um, he had been the Prime Minister of Qatar from 2007 to 2013, the Foreign Minister from 92 to 2013, and the CEO of Qatar Investment Authority, or QIA. Um, he was the single person responsible for the disposition of the Qatar's $320 billion fund, and this made him perhaps the only person on the planet with power that compared to Vladimir Putin. You know, when it came to money and decision making, he was an extremely powerful guy. Okay, so at this point, I don't know if you guys know where Qatar is. Some people call it Qatar, Q-U, Q-A-T-A-R, Cutter, I say cutter because that's how Rachel Maddow calls it. So uh, it is a, a, a peninsula um, on the east coast of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And um, it's um, kind of... Uh, um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of just off to the side uh, onto the on the east side of um, the Arabian Peninsula, okay? And um, but uh, they were being isolated by the Saudi Kingdom, and he was trying to put this guy in the good graces of the president. So uh, let's see, Hamad was differential and highly respectful of my role, and he wanted a one-on-one -on -one sit down with Trump. So. Um, there, they, there Michael was, going to Mar-a-Lago Lago to meet with them. And uh, the dining room was packed, and um, the, packed with billionaires. Um, but in that, in that crowd, Trump was God among gods. So there was a single table in the center, surrounded by red velvet rope to isolate it from the others. And there were three settings, place settings there. One was for Trump, one was for Michael, and one was for um, Hamad bin Jazim. Um, so Michael is like in hog heaven. He's like, I have made it. He's, he was just like floating on air thinking he was a big deal, okay? Well, for, for Hamad and Michael were sitting at their seats but then one of the wait staff said, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. So then everybody stood up and clapped right like they do. Um, and everybody probably stayed standing up until the president took his seat because that's what you do. Um, but anyway, Michael was like, a, he said he felt like a billion dollars. He was, he was bulletproof, you know, and at the center of attention, blah, blah, blah. Now, these three guys sat at this table um, in the middle of all these people. And they sat there for uh, three, two hours to discussing everything from um, Middle East geopolitics, economy, um, the needs of certain regions, underlying reasons for the Sunni Shiite division and the war in, rebel, in Yemen. And he talked about ISIS and Hezbollah and Iran. And, um, and it also... Uh, he also wanted to talk to Trump because Trump was very close to MBS, who is Mohammed bin Salman, you know, the guy that cut, had Khashoggi cut up. So the Saudis hated the Qataris, so this um, meeting was inf of infinite value, Michael says. Michael says he felt like he hit the, jack he hit the Powerball jackpot for $700 million, and he was... Sure, Trump had his back. Nothing would happen to me, I was sure, no matter what. Okay, so uh, then they entered, in, Michael and Trump introduced Hamad to several uh, Hatsi Tatsi guys because uh, Trump or Hamad wanted to, um, like some of these people needed money to, to, to fund their. Um, to fund their um, 
like one guy had a nuclear power, nuclear power plant that he needed money for, and he introduced Hamad to this guy because he thought, well, Hamad has all this money, and he was going to throw it in the, into the United States. So here's a guy could use two, two million or two billion, you know, two, two million is nothing to these people. So then he's, okay, so then he's back in Manhattan, and the whole reason, this is, talks about how he um, uh, was living in a hotel room, and um, because one of the neighbors had a pipe break in their Park Avenue hotel, and it caused a lot of damage at Michael's, uh, at Michael's apartment. Um, and some had said he was on the lam. And I, of course, thought the same thing. Why is he living in a hotel? Well, he was redecorating because, and, you know, and fixing up their house because it, it had had a, a leak. So anyway, Michael gets back to Manhattan and he, and, um, um, he wakes Jake up at six. I guess Samantha's off at college um, or at school, or maybe she doesn't even live there anymore. I don't know how old she is. So at this point... Um, so he makes, uh, he makes uh, coffee and oatmeal, he turns on the TV, Jake's, Jake's gone, and he's like uh, just walking around and he's got, you know, they they got their sweatpants on and, you know, still in their pajamas and stuff like that. And there's a knock at the door and he looked through the peephole and saw a crowd of men in the hallway holding up badges. FBI, Mr. Cohen, please open the door. So he opened the door and... Um, they told him that they had a wa warrant for three hotel rooms his pa family occupied, as well as his cell phone, his office, his safe deposit box, his law office, and apartment. And they said, we know you have firearms in here. Where are they? And are they loaded? And he said yes, and he told them where they were. And um, so Michael was in shock. He said, to say I would, was in shock would be a huge understatement. Uh, because... Trump had told him, Trump had assured him that he wasn't on, you know, he, he, that Mueller wasn't looking at him. He, Michael thought he was bulletproof. And now he feels like El Chapo. What the fuck? Am I El Chapo all of a sudden? Uh, so uh, he and Laura so sat on the bed and uh, waited for them to get done. And, and uh, he, Michael even offered them coffee. He was very nice. He's a very, can be very nice. Um, and he did thank them for waiting until Jake went to school. Um, Michael says he has never been in trouble with the law before. He's had one speeding ticket in his life and a handful of parking tickets. And that was it. That was it. Um, and the, now the FBI is going through his couches and seat cushions and all that kind of thing. And so they have no idea what they're looking for. I mean, Michael and Laura have no idea what the FBI is looking for. So... But he wanted to call the president, so, uh, but they wouldn't let him have his phones. He couldn't touch the phones. So he told, he told the FBI guys how to get to the president's phone number, and they read it to him, and he wrote it down. And as soon as they left, oh, then Samantha, then Samantha came, comes in. What the hell is going on? Okay, so after five hours, the FBI left. They took all, a whole bunch of boxes of their possessions. Um, he, Michael left and went immediately to the AT&T store in Lexington and bought a new phone and uh, he called the White House to tell the president what happened. The president, uh, he, and the message was relayed to the president and the president immediately called back and said, they're coming after all of us. This is all a part of the witch hunt. Stay strong, I have your back. That's what the president told him. And so... With that ringing in his ears, he felt like, okay, I'm going to be okay. This is going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine because the president has my back. And then he says, in the back of my mind, I knew the trouble was coming. Because when Trump went on the air, he said, oh yeah, Michael's just one of my personal attorneys. And so that is how he knew Trump was distancing him distancing himself from Michael, and all of a sudden, he's only one of his attorneys. So Michael began to sense dread, and ladies and gentlemen, that was the last time that Michael Cohen ever spoke to Donald Trump. 
the end of chapter 16. That's 30 minutes. Got to stop it. Be back in a little while.